The goal of this video is to compare and contrast the three uh, models of valuation. One is called the discounted dividends model. Second one is called discounted free cash flow. And the third one is discounted abnormal earnings. Um, they are all rooted in the same underlying concepts. And uh, what we're going to do is essentially show you um, that they are pretty much the same. Uh, if there's a difference, it's between discounted dividends and discounted free cash flow. Free cash flow is a, kind of a, a, a term of art and uh, with some specific assumptions, we can make them work out the same as you'll see in the eval software. But um, let's get started and, and we'll start out with discounted dividends first. This is the dividend discount model. And it says that uh, we're going to uh, discount dividends in period one by one plus the cost of equity capital or the discount rate on, on equity capital. And we'll bring that back to today's value to, by discounting it with, with, by dividing by one plus RE. And period two, we do the same thing. We bring that back. And period three, we bring it back. And PE is the current intrinsic value. It's not necessarily the same thing as what the stock price is, although um, the efficient market hypothesis capital asset pricing model would suggest that they should be the same. And we can write it more succinctly by uh, sort of summing all of the future periods of discount uh, of dividends um, by one plus re for each period t out into the future and here we can break it out this is this is just separates the forecast period here and a terminal growth rate period out here where g is the growth rate in uh, once we get to sort of market equil equilibrium, we assume that the growth rate in the economy is, is G. Um, and that the, typically there's a higher cost of equity capital over that G. And uh, we can essentially break this out into two parts. This is the estimation period. And this is the terminal period. Again, we assume a, a constant dividends, uh, constant and continuing cost of equity capital and the growth rate, uh, G. That'll bring it back here. Uh, and this part here will dividend. These will discount each one to the to the beginning of the terminal period, and then this will discount that one value back to here. So some of the problems that we have with discounting dividends, most growth companies don't pay any dividends, and they probably aren't going to plan to pay any dividends for a long time. So we have this long period of a drought in dividends. Um, they, most companies reinvest a large portion of their earnings rather than paying them out. And the dividends measure the wealth distribution rather than the wealth creation. So if, for example, uh, management doesn't pay out the dividends as they should, um, for example, there's some agency costs uh, that prevent managers from distributing the um, dividends when they're when it makes sense to do that. In other words, when it when the uh, internal uh, opportunities are not as great as they would be outside the firm, then it makes sense for the company to distribute dividends to. Um, but many times we see 
managers holding on to wealth inside the firm for empire building on um, other reasons and uh, so that's a, that's a creates a difference between wealth creation and wealth distribution and for that reason we, we tend to look uh, at di the discounted free cash flow model and with the discounted free cash flow model and this is this is the one approach here that the free cash flow model so it's, we're estimating free cash flows that is to all of the capital providers both the debt and the equity holders and then we uh, we do that we add that all up and in each year we discount it back to today's value using the weighted average cost of capital which includes both equity and debt and that total expected future cash flows is discounted back to today and then we subtract the debt that today and that will give us the value of the, of the equity at uh, the present value of the equity so what is free cash flows typically we we estimate uh, free cash flows as cash from operations minus cash outlays for investments we have some problems with that though because cash flows are difficult to forecast we typically forecast in a complete income statement balance sheet and cash statement of cash flows but with the cash statement of cash flows comes last and in that we normally forecast sales first and then we forecast all of the other expenses to get down to net income and then we back out all of the things that are in net income but don't affect cash flows and and we add in the things that affect cash flows but don't affect net income and so we have a forecast error in forecasting sales and, and expenses but then we also have a substantial forecast error in for, forecasting cash flows as a result um, forecasting cash flows is more messy uh, than just forecasting net income cash flows provide a noisy and untimely measure of, of firm performance and in fact cash flows can be negative for a long time especially if you're a growth company you're building out trying to establish market share and we've got this noisy and untimely um, measure of performance that very well may not reflect to the underlying econ economics of the firm and they're they're forecasted indirectly as I said earlier first we have to forecast income and then we adjust for non-cash items is there a way to reach the same answer using accounting numbers and the answer here is yes we're going to start out with the dividend discount model that I gave you earlier that is we forecast dividends for each year and we we discount them back at the cost of equity capital and this is the theoretically preferred model it's it's the best measure of the value of, of, a, of a, a stock It's very difficult to predict when and if the dividends will be paid and how much they'll be it's also difficult of course to understand the cost of equity capital but it is very strong in terms of theory and what we're going to do is we're going to start with that and then we're going to manipulate it a little bit with some algebra the algebra looks like this we assume a clean surplus and with clean surplus we are saying that the book value at the end of the period that is shareholders equity off the balance sheet at the end of the period is equal to shareholders equity at the beginning of the period plus net income minus dividends for the year it gives us the ending book value we can rearrange this by adding d1 to both sides that cancels this out and subtracting bv1 from both sides and we have cancels this out and puts it over here what it's saying is that we know that 
if we know book value at the beginning of the period, shareholders equity at the beginning of the period, shareholders equity at the end of the period, and net income, we can forecast dividends. And if we take the dividends here and replace that with all of these terms in each of these periods and just assume a two-period model, then we have instead of D1 and D2, we have all the beginning of book value equity plus net income minus book value equity at the end. Do the same thing for each period. And we now have a two-period dividend discount model that is starting to look a little bit different. And then if we assume that book value at the beginning of the period is equal to book value at the beginning of the period, just get rid of this, but then if we add book value at the beginning of the period minus book value at the beginning of the period, that should work, right? Well then we can multiply the two terms that cancel each other out by a constant and they still are going to cancel each other out. So we, we've got R sub E and R sub E. And now we can factor out 1 plus R E and we have BV0 times 1 plus R E minus this term is equal to BV0. Now we can take all of this, BV0, beginning of period book value, and we put it in here. All of this goes in there, and that's exactly what we were doing. So book, book, beginning of period zero book value is shareholders' equity, and we replace that in this equation. So we have beginning of period zero, um, and beginning of period one, and then the rest of it is net income minus book value, we just disc discount that back times zero. And then we are going to expand these things out. All of these things are going to be de uh, deflated by the cost of one plus the cost of equity capital or, or the rate of return on equity capital discount the, the cost of equity capital. And then we can um, do some cancel line, canceling. Cancel this, cancel that. Now we're going to put the terms back together. We have this BV0 is going to be equal to net income minus a normal rate of return on book value is going to be our abnormal earnings and we're going to deflate that at the one plus the cost of equity capital for one year. And then we have net income for year two minus the cost of equity capital times the beginning of, of book value for year two. And that'll give us the abnormal earnings that we expect for year two and we deflate that. And we add this to shareholders' equity, and we end up with this terminal value, the book value, and we're gonna, at the end of the period, and we're gonna deflate that and bring it and add it. And th those are going to be, um, uh, th this is called the discounted abnormal earnings or residual income model. Typically, that be, the last term becomes inconsequential as the number of years in the forecast horizon increases. So we have this, and this is the overall model, and it says that the value of the equity is equal to book value plus the discounted value of abnormal earnings here for all future earnings, that we, since we're summing them, bringing them back and adding that, and that becomes the value of the equity and this is perhaps a little bit easier in terms of forecasting. Some of the advantages, earnings are reasonably reliable. 
and they're widely used. They're timely measure. Typically, if, when a, a company issues its anal it, its earnings report, it doesn't even issue the cash flow report. Earnings are, are what get announced first. Um, the accounting analysis and the ratio analysis that we do provide us with a framework for evaluating the earnings performance. We're going to focus on earnings. And we typically see people using earnings or earnings per share as the normal currency that they, they, they use in, in valuing and analyzing companies. So we like this uh, abnormal earnings approach. It is, it's important to recognize, the same underlying mo model as the dividend discount model. Here's another way to look at it with a little bit of math. We can say that the price to book ratio, which is very easy, so we can see the price of a stock minus the book value per share of that stock. And that gives us a measure of the expected future growth of that company. How much is the stock market expecting the, the company to be worth in discounted terms versus how much is it worth in terms of the shareholders' equity? This is the price to book ratio. And we can, with, with some math, we can rearrange the discounted abnormal earnings and say, that, well, well that's, that's built on, number one, generating a long-term abnormal, positive abnormal earnings, net income minus the cost of equity capital that um, deflated by the beginning uh, stockholders' equity. So if that's a positive number, that is, we're earning more than the cost of equity capital. And number two, we're growing book value over time. That is, our beginning of period for any period of time exceeds the uh, beginning shareholder's equity, exceeds the shareholder equity back at time zero. Then we're we've got a multiplying effect by having a positive ratio here. We multiply that positive ratio times the excess, the abnormal earnings rate that we earn each year. And that's going to give us a higher price to book ratio. And again, we can, we can use this math and we can uh, come up with um, what the price to book ratio should be based upon our assumptions about the future. So here's a sum, uh, summary. Discounted dividends, DCF, discounted free cash flow, or DCF, and discounted abnormal earnings, also referred to as residual income, they're all theoretically valid valuation models. And indeed, the discounted dividend model and the residual income model are one and the same. I showed you the math is the same. Your valuation should always be based on a complete and consistent set of fore forecasted financial statements. We are not into using rules of thumb, peg ratios, PE ratios. Those, those things, they can be useful to a limited extent primarily for getting an idea of what the market thinks about the company. But um, what we need to do is do our own intrinsic value by forecasting the complete set of financial statements. Your forecast horizon must extend out far enough so that you reach a constant terminal growth rate. And what we look to there is how long is it going to be before there's a market equilibrium because if there's an abnormal earnings going on in that industry, uh, he, competitors are moving in. And when they get to the point where the co there's kind of full competition, there won't be any abnormal earnings. And at that point, we can just discount the future as, as um, just a normal growth rate. There you have a comparison of three different approaches to valuation.